First, you see the mountains, towering rippled folds of earth stretching more than 60 miles across Pennsylvania's Allegheny Plateau, dividing the Atlantic seaboard from the rich heartland of America. But soon the valleys that lie between those ridges and foothills come into view. Fertile land where humans first planted crops more than a thousand years ago, and where today's farmers continue a long agricultural tradition. Generations labored to carve fields from the forests, to tap the region's natural resources, and to pass on to their children the proud heritage of a life lived on the land. The exhibits and reconstructed farmsteads here at the Somerset Historical Center will carry you through two and a half centuries of rural life in southwestern Pennsylvania, exploring the things that have changed and those that have stayed the same in the lives of our farming families. Long before Europeans settled along the Atlantic shoreline of America, the Alleghenies were dotted with the fields and villages of the Monongahela people, whose broken pottery and stone tools may still be found in the soil of Somerset County. Disease and warfare took their toll on these native people, who had all but disappeared by the time that Swedish and Dutch emigrants began the settlements that would later become Pennsylvania. In the years that followed the disappearance of the Monongahela, few Native Americans permanently lived in the region. Indian hunters did come in search of furs and hides to exchange with British and French traders for European goods. By the 1720s, Delaware, Shawnee, and Iroquois families from eastern Pennsylvania and western New York began to resettle this country, clearing fields and building villages. Eventually, rivalry between Britain and France over control of the Indian trade and the rich Ohio country led to war. The stakes were high. One European observer boasted, nature seems to have furnished this country in the most lavish manner, with all the conveniences and comforts of life. In 1753, hoping to drive British traders and settlers away, the French began building a line of forts. Virginians under young George Washington tried unsuccessfully to stop the French advance. In the summer of 1755, British General Edward Braddock extended Washington's road to the forks of the Ohio, but his army was attacked and defeated by a force of French and Indians. Three years later, the British finally succeeded in securing this area. The Forbes Road opened a second route across the Alleghenies and brought British garrisons to forts strung like beads along the paths and waterways of the Old Northwest. This was still Indian country, but a growing number of Europeans wished to settle these lands. Illegal squatters poured out of Pennsylvania, Maryland, and Virginia. There comes such crowds of hunters, one British commander reported, as fills those woods. Tension between Indians, soldiers, and squatters limited the spread of settlement until 1768, when the Iroquois sold the lands between the Allegheny Mountains and the Ohio River to the British. Then, the trickle of emigrants swelled into a flood. You can't conceive what numbers of people from the adjacent colonies are daily coming into this country, wrote one visitor in Pittsburgh. A Presbyterian minister called them poor and enterprising people who leave their old habitations and connections and go in quest of lands for themselves and children. In a few short years, more than 30,000 people crossed the Allegheny Mountains, many of them settling in southwestern Pennsylvania. The American Revolution temporarily reversed the tide of settlement, but with peace and independence came a fresh wave of emigrants. Old America, a visiting Englishman observed, seems to be breaking up and moving westward. 
By the 1790s, most of these travelers were headed farther west, but some joined in the work of carving farms out of the forested hills and valleys that lay between the Allegheny and Chestnut Ridges. Those early farms averaged about 200 acres, with a small area roughly cleared by girdling and burning the trees. Surrounded by dark, seemingly endless forest, settlers often referred to the area as the Shades of Death. One pioneer woman wrote in her diary, Of the forest, my first impression was, I am imprisoned, swallowed deep in its gloomy throat. Clearing, planting, and building was hard work. Farming implements were often crude, and it was many years before more progressive techniques fully replaced slash-and-burn agriculture. Cash was scarce. Bad roads and distant markets made it difficult to sell bulky grain, except when distilled into whiskey. Still, these early farmers were never totally isolated or self-sufficient. Cloth, tools, and other goods arrived by pack horse from the east. In return, forest products like potash, finished lumber, deer hides, ginseng, and maple sugar provided additional income. Travel became more convenient in the years following the American Revolution. Federal, state, and private investment funded the construction of bridges and new roads. These gave farmers better access to markets and provided a steady stream of travelers headed west who needed food, lodging, and supplies. One of the most important projects was the construction of the National Road, which ran from Cumberland on the Potomac River to Wheeling on the Ohio. Completed by 1820, the National Road expanded markets for agricultural produce. Large Conestoga wagons, the tractor trailers of their day, carried crops to the east, returning with manufactured goods and emigrants bound for the lands beyond the Ohio. But the heyday of the wagon drivers was soon challenged by other forms of transportation. First, there was the Pennsylvania Canal, shortly followed by the Pennsylvania Railroad. Stretching from Philadelphia to Pittsburgh, the railroad was completed in 1854, tying southwestern Pennsylvania more closely than ever before to expanding national and international markets. The transportation revolution was accompanied by no less dramatic changes in agricultural technology. A fascinating variety of new horse-drawn machines increased production with fewer hands. Scientific experimentation produced improved crops and livestock. Items like well pumps, cast iron stoves, and other household goods transformed domestic life. Not everyone welcomed change. Some farmers were just plain suspicious of innovation and investment. Others were motivated by spiritual concerns. They resisted the new agricultural practices, machinery, and other conveniences. Their commitment to a more traditional way of life helped to preserve the rich rural landscape you can still see today. As new farmland in the Midwest brought into production after the 1820s, undercut local producers, area farmers had to search for markets closer to home. There were other changes. Industry, mining iron and steel production in the mountains, furnaces and mills surrounding Johnstown and Pittsburgh, brought thousands of immigrants to work in the coal fields and factories. This influx of new residents caused a major change in the social fabric of the area. Railroads bought up right-of-ways and purchased vast amounts of timber for rail ties, while quarries and brick-making operations added to the local economy. America's days as a nation of farmers were numbered. By the end of the First World War, Western Pennsylvania was a leading producer of bituminous coal for the United States. Young people were increasingly leaving the farm for better job opportunities in the cities. 
With mechanization and specialization of crops and livestock, fewer accomplished much more work and farm management became much more complex. Tractors replaced horses in the field and science brought greater precision to the art of raising food. Telephones, radios, electric lights, and better postal delivery also helped to more fully integrate farming families into the emerging American popular culture. Automobiles knit communities and regions together as never before. The old route General Forbes constructed in 1758 gave way to a new paved road shortly before the First World War, a practice that soon spread throughout the state and nation. Many young people returned to family farms during the difficult years of the Great Depression. But economic revival and the Second World War sparked yet another exodus. In the decades following the war, the percentage of farmers in southwestern Pennsylvania fell to less than 5% of the population. But the land continues to nurture human life and feed our imagination. Adaptable as ever, the farmers of southwestern Pennsylvania are drawing new patterns on the land, introducing novel products, finding innovative uses for old crops, but also preserving the time-honored traditions that link us, no matter where we come from, to a shared past. The Somerset Historical Center is your gateway on the pathway of progress to exploring this rich rural heritage. Welcome.